Okay, perfect. So um, this is a research that I'm doing along with my supervisor, Professor Eleni Teodoropoulou and Professor Vilhelmini Karayani and Dr. Vagelia Sosidu. Um, we are going to show you the governmental and non-governmental involvement in stray companion animals management in Greece. Let's talk about talking about the problem, the companion animal overpopulation prob problem in Greece. Around 3 million stray companion animals are at the moment roaming the streets of Greece according to the homeless index. The majority of them are cats, an estimation of 2 million. The overpopulation problem causes poor animal welfare living conditions for the homeless animals, but also public security issues public health and additional costs to governmental and non-governmental organizations that work on their management. Regarding the legislation in Greece, a new law has been put into effect from September 2021, which regulates the human-animal relationships as far as responsible ownership is concerned, but also stray companion animal management. On the one hand, owners are obliged to sterilize their cats and dogs and microchip them, if they wish not to do so, they ought to send their animals DNA at the laboratory for conservation and analysis of pet generic material. Breeding is allowed provided that all of the offsprings are legally adopted and under conditions that ensure the female's well-being and no exploitation. If a dog or a cat owner decides they wanted to stop caring for their pet, they have the ability to pay a fee to their municipality and relinquish them at the municipality shelter to be handled by local authorities. Municipalities are responsible for the management of stray pet animals along with the help of animal welfare organizations if needed. The program Argos, which comes from the loyal dog of Odysseus, King Odysseus, the ancient king, sends multiple goals for stray management by the municipalities. These goals are collection of the animals and serializations, shelter and adoption promotion, local governmental shelters are being established sometimes in association with non-governmental animal welfare. Anna, can I ask you a quick question? Are your slides supposed to be scrolling? Oh, yes, they are. You cannot yeah. see them. Okay. Uh, we can see the first one. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, can you see them now? If I if you see if I get out of the slideshow, can you see now my screen? Yes, we can see the legal framework. It's inside the whole um yeah. Yeah, so it's not okay. scrolling as you're speaking, just to let you know. Thanks. Okay. Uh, would you mind if I continue my presentation like this? Please, yeah, however you want. Yeah, no problem. All right. So, yes, I was I was on this slide, and now moving forward for the what we did on our research. For this study, we investigated the operational process and the costs that are, are associated with exercising the, the, the new regulations and the ARGERS program. A nationwide online survey was distributed to designated workers of the Greek municipalities and workers or volunteers at animal welfare organizations. Now, the data that we collected includes responses for 31 participants, municipality and animal welfare organizations. Some statistical information here. We see that the majority of the respondents are located in urban areas. The number of people working exclusively on stray management, the majority is one to five workers. 14 out of 31 organizations have one to five workers. Here we see the average days a cat, a stray cat stays in the shelter. 18% stay one to seven days, 3% eight to 14 days, 7% 15 to 30 days, 11% 31 to 60, 11% 61 to 90, and 50% more than 91 days. Moving forward to the same question about dogs, the average days a stray dog stays in this shelter, 7% 1 to 7 days, 7% 8 to 14 days, 4% 15 to 30 days, 10% 31 to 60 days, 10% 61 to 90 days, and 62% more than 91 days. Regarding the animal welfare cost per month, we gather the total average cost of management is 1,099.30 euros for dogs, 720.93 for cats. The average cost for food provision per month 
is 418.07 for dogs, 430.54 for cats. And the average housing cost is 463.2 for dogs and 151.5 for cats. We have looked into for European uh, official numbers for animal welfare costs per month, but there is no um, official statistic for that. So we asked, how do they think, how do response, respondents think that the new law and management program is sustainable and effective in addressing the overpopulation problem of stray pets? Now, out of the 31 um, workers at municipalities and animal worker who responded our survey, the 12 said that they strongly disagree, 10 that they disagree, 8 that they neither agree nor disagree, 1 that they agree, and no one said that they strongly agree. The study also examined the characteristics that are more likely to be adopted by Greek citizens from an animal shelter. We uh, took 280 dog adoption data were collected from an animal welfare organization and analyzed. The organization is located in an island in Greece, Lesbos. The model that was used was the Cox Proportional Hazards Model. The data was analyzed using Stata 14 statistical software. Here is the module of the model. Now, the, the results indicated that smaller sized dogs had a higher likelihood of being adopted faster. Fair colored dogs and black and white colored dogs were adopted faster than black colored dogs. In conclusion, the new law could potentially solve the overpopulation issue in Greece. However, 68% of the survey respondents from municipalities and animal welfare organizations claimed that they strongly disagree or and disagree with the sustainability of the new law. More than half of the stray companion animals stay at the shelters for at least three months, which makes the economic cost for the municipalities and animal welfare organizations increase significantly. Our model proved that people prefer small sized dogs and light color coated dogs. And lastly, through the answers we received from our respondents, it is of high importance that responsible ownership becomes widely communicated and regulated. And that is my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk about Indian free living dogs. Uh, before I start, I'd like to clarify a few things about these dogs um, to avoid misunderstanding. Uh, Indian free living dogs are not similar to the ones that we might see in places like Europe or North America. They are not ex-companion dogs that have been abandoned or lost. Most of them have been born on the streets, brought up by other dogs for several generations from what we can see and possibly going back a long, long time in history. Uh, they're not persecuted by the government, but rather are legally protected to some extent. Uh, I mean, there are parts of the country where they are illegally persecuted, but uh, in a city like Bangalore, for instance, they are uh, they're not very, uh, they're quite friendly and therefore the term feral or stray is inappropriate for them, both technically and also from the perspective of understanding who they are. This is not a feral animal and it would not be right to use that term for our discussion here. Free living dog may be uh, technically more accurate, but I feel it's not entirely adequate either. So I'm going to use the term streety. It's, a, it's not technical, it's a term of endearment that's used by the people here who care for the dogs out here. And so I use it to give you an idea of where I come from and probably set context for uh, what I'm going to say next. People in India, they do not take good care of those dogs there. This is what I once heard a renowned ethologist claim in an international conference. And that got me thinking, why was that said? And what was it based on? Was it based on notion of care for what are considered, uh, in quotes, owned animals? What would be considered good care for unowned animals or bad care uh, and free living animals? And uh, what does care currently look like in Bangalore City, the one that's been labeled not good? What I see around does not look like lack of care. 
there are thousands of people who call themselves feeders who go out and feed anywhere from 5 to 10 maybe hundreds and during the lockdown it, the numbers went up to 1000 2000 even and these are everyday office goers who come back from 10 to 12 hours of day uh, work and cook fresh food and go out and feed not just the first 10 or 100 dogs then they see but 100 dogs that they know by name and pay enough attention to to notice even a scratch as one feeder claimed to me they get to know these dogs and their care extends beyond feeding into medical intervention and it's really a relationship an interspecies bond i care for a few dogs in this manner not that many very few but um, <clears throat> what strikes me is the emotional challenge involved in this type of care it involves a bond a friendship and that means there's room for heartache with our dogs we kind of own their lives we control a lot of it and so it's easy to keep them safe and that protects us from heartache because that's what we want to do for our loved ones right but loving and bonding with a street dog means that you're giving your heart to a dog who may not turn up one day or maybe even worse and it's so it's, it hurts it hurts every every time and it's very tempting to stop giving such care uh and so i am always humbled by those who are able to care for hundreds and thousands of such animals give their hearts so generously and still respect the rights of these animals to their freedom it does not seem like they're falling short of care by not taking them into their homes and in quotes owning them responsibly but they're actually extending themselves past their ability of the number of animals they can care for in their own home and caring for animals in need outside of their homes and doing it at much risk to their own emotional well-being this is care um i was recently in conversation with a person who runs a shelter that is in partnership with uh, the local civic body to provide medical intervention for streeties with the help of such caring citizens and as i was talking to her she says you know sindhu it's almost 5 o'clock our helplines are going to open now and there are going to be non stop calls with people asking questions about this their streeties asking for pictures and videos and following up till the dogs are safely returned to where they were picked up from which is legally required in india it's illegal to relocate dogs in india technically uh then there are the more casual caregivers for the lack of a better phrase those who kind of work it into their routine to put um leftovers to the dog that's waiting outside the one that they know and recognize sometimes even adding a little bit extra in sometimes offering a burlap sack for the dog to curl up in during uh, the winter or letting them curl up under the awning during the monsoons um the care can also extend into medical interventions if they know it's available and can afford it um it may not seem like much but it does add up and therefore is significant to our discussions and I'll circle back to that so why did this ethologist label this as poor care maybe if you're going to look at care from the template of care of uh, owned animals then perhaps maybe this is not so great care Uh, Radha Krishna and colleagues say uh, and I quote there is little emphasis on promoting responsible dog ownership practices highlighting and they highlight um what they are probably suggesting are poor standards of ownership now i'm not validating this but if this were true this may indeed be a cause for concern and hence is significant for our discussion so this is also something i'll circle back to later so those are the two kind of types of care that i'll talk about regardless of how people care for owned animals it does not reflect in care provided for unowned animals in fact care given to streeties seem to be significant enough to actually be seen as getting in the way of achieving eradication of zoonoses like rabies in india tiwari and colleagues report that almost 80% of the respondents in their study reluctantly admitted to feeding free living dogs similar findings surface in several other papers that i've listed i quote equally crucial will be measures to deal with extensive free living dog population in india without which rabies control efforts will become unsustainable in the long run so this brings us to the second part of my topic rabies this argument of care giving getting in the way of eradicating rabies is problematic in that um it conflates eradication of rabies with eradication of streeties and one is seen as necessary to achieve the other but that does not have to be the case 
what do we know about rabies eradication we are rabies eradication of free living dogs we know that it's not an idea that seems to have had much success in india going all the way back to uh, the east india company and then the british raj and subsequent indian governments it was revealed as far back as 1964 by blue cross india that the catch and kill program that was run by the madras corporation for over 100 years had in fact been unsuccessful since then there have been several studies confirming this and i list them but why did it not work the coppingers argue that dogs evolved into this ecological niche around human beings i concur with their idea and would build on it to say that not only did they evolve into our ecological niche but we evolved to support their lives knowingly or unknowingly and countries like india present the perfect condition for this entanglement to take shape and thrive to this day i believe this is why we have been unable to get rid of them despite the sustained efforts and if we do keep at it and do succeed i suspect that there will be some dire consequences for instance uh, the species that are less easy to vaccinate like rats or snakes may occupy move to occupy the void the dogs leave behind regardless of why it's not working it's important to note here that treaty eradication has not worked but there are other strategies that have indeed helped several case studies from india demonstrate notable success in eradicating rabies despite the presence of free living dogs um, and the most notable of them more recently is the tremendous work by mission rabies in goa lots of interesting studies coming out from there as well if for those of you are interested of course there's this is limited success but they have created opportunity for us to start exam examining what can make this successful at a larger scale consider the findings by fitzpatrick and colleague that suggest that we will be able to significantly bring down costs and therefore scale up vaccinating of dogs if it did not require catchers but instead could have people bringing dogs in for vaccination and this is where we see, i see the role of care so let me give you an example i'm out here on a farm lots of uh, Uh, there are dogs here but it's a very sparsely populated uh, uh, area I mean, in terms of human population and so the dogs are not yet very friendly they're not socialized with us uh, and so we've been struggling to get them vaccinated a few of us who have been trying and we realized that the only way to do it was care to start feeding petting smiling at them so on and so forth and the cool thing about dogs unlike lots of free living animals here and out here in the farm peacocks mongooses snakes rats cats dogs what not uh, but what What's interesting about dogs is it's so easy you just start providing a little bit of affection and care and a smile and they become approachable very very quickly making vaccinating them a lot more feasible a final note on feasibility if we were to compare solutions like um, masculine that's of course inhuman uh, and unlikely for the indian policy to go in that direction but what about other solutions like adoptions so the two points that i brought up earlier need to be considered one is the notion of care of owned animals i have worked as a consultant for people who have companion dogs and i would probably agree that it's not something that a lot of people in india are very well informed on uh, perhaps because we don't have a long history of this kind of ownership of these dogs and even uh, with a lot of intense private consultation changing this seems to be a hard task more so if you're going to be looking at rural settings uh, of india like with or tiny houses with uh, you know 10 feet by 10 feet houses with no yard and no place for the dogs there so there are many cultural financial and logistical hurdles then there is the additional challenge of adopt adapt adoptability of local dogs that are called indies and there is a cultural resistance to them because owned dogs look more like european dogs in our minds even if we got past it all educated people financed them and got them to adopt uh, one or 10 million dogs of this country as the estimates say then there is the task of ensuring that they're not relinquished and all the feeders stop feeding taylor and colleagues say and i quote changing attitudes and practices towards this activity feeding free living dogs that is may be extremely difficult but this suggests that encouraging coexistence may actually be more doable given our situation it's already in practice though not legitimized adequately however the scale of care that is being provided is what i want to draw your attention to it's quite significant that means that the starting point for this would be a lot lot simpler there are no minds to change what may be required is validating people's care of these dogs as necessary and important 
for rabies eradication and improving one health kritika shrinivasan talks about the idea of decolonized notions of cities as sites of cohabitation rather than sites of human dominion yamini narayanan talks about a similar idea but in the context of snakes cohabitation is indeed not a novel idea but maybe one better suited for india i feel and of course along with validation minimal awareness like the availability of government sponsored free vaccinations for these animals can go a long way for the more recently approved oral rabies vaccines reduces the reliance on catchers and other veterinary staff further dropping costs this makes it easy even for those who cannot transport dogs oral vaccines may be distributed through public health care centers as part of one health initiative so there would be no additional infrastructure required either I'd like to end with an anecdote. Recently, I attended a, a session by a snake, a local snake expert, who talked to us about the ideas of coexisting with snakes. The speaker mentioned that they regularly do this type of workshop in many parts of the country, particularly semi-urban or rural parts of the country, and they get good response from people where they understand the need for not killing snakes and strive to coexist. It got me thinking. So this is a country where we seem to be able to get people to learn how to coexist with <laughs> venomous serpents. Surely that should not be that difficult with dogs. Um, I'd like to leave you with this photograph. This is of a recent protest in Mumbai city with people defending their right to feed these dogs. It's things like this that tell me that this is probably feasible and definitely needs a closer, serious re-examination. -exam Thank you. Humans feeding free roaming cats without offering other services. I became interested in this topic while working at the San Francisco SPCA where I oversaw the community cats program for five years. One of my responsibilities was helping the public manage free roaming cats. During my interactions with cats and humans, I noticed patterns of behavior around feeding. Who are feeding the cats? Organization volunteers who agree to certain guidelines, feeding might be a volunteer task. Loose networks of cat folks, some may work with organizations as well. Within this group, there is usually a strong focus on feeding, even if they offer other care like trap, neuter, return. And individuals who may not know of other people or services available. I've seen two types of feeders, active feeders who go from place to place to feed and passive feeders who feed at their house or workplace. Both groups may accept help for other services, though their primary focus is feeding. So here are some exact examples of active feeders. The person who feeds where the tarp is has 10 feeding stations. He does not live in this community and has been asked repeatedly to stop feeding. He feeds twice a day. He says he only has time to feed, so he can't do anything else with the cats. The fence slat moves, and behind it is a feeding station managed by someone else. This is next to a busy police station. Every year there are kittens at this location, and I've even pulled litters out of police car engines. Common traits of active feeders are, they tend to just leave food out, as seen in these photos. Complaints from people in the communities where they feed, which they are rarely a part of. They think they're the only ones who are or can take care of the cats. Passive feeders usually live in feed in one location where they live or work. This can cause conflict with neighbors if they're messy feeders, have a lot of cats, or are attracting wildlife. These first two images are next door to each other, so both families are feeding. This is on a very busy street, and there have been complaints about cats being hit by cars, as well as attracting wildlife and cats damaging people's yards. These passive feeders are very close to, together, and food is always abundant. An additional challenge, which is true of the last slide too, is one family's first language is Spanish and the others is Cantonese, so communicating can be challenging. This is a common issue in San Francisco. In the last 10 years, I've been coming to this location. There are always young cats. It has been an ongoing source of complaints, especially as the community garden has grown. While at the SPCA, we saw a lot of kittens from this location come into us with Pan Luke. It's because this virus can live in the soil for a really long time. This isn't a problem unique to San Francisco. For example, 
this information is posted on the Hong Kong SPCA website about feeding free roaming cats and the issues it can cause for their program. So the impact this has on humans, conflict with neighbors and communities about messy feeding and the number of cats is one of the most common issues. Feeders put a significant amount of their own money towards food and gas to feed cats. While there can be positive mental health aspects, like some people feel like the free roaming cats are like their pets, they can be seen as a natur nat natural pest control and people like feeling useful. There are also downsides. Carl, whose house is on the lower left in the slide, would not eat until the cats were fed and had eaten. I've also worked with actual animal hoarders, though feeders are more like a free roaming hoarder. I've worked with people who are stuff hoarders who passively feed large colonies on their property, so I feel like there's a connection. Zoonotic disease spread, such as ringworm, parasites, and fleas, can also be an issue, and feeding does attract wildlife. Impact on the cats. They can become dependent on people feeding them. A constant food source can make cats difficult to trap, not just for TNR, but if they're sick or injured. And when people move, die, or when locations are demolished, cats lose that feeding source. This also creates some health concerns. All of this food can create disease and breeding grounds when the colonies aren't controlled. There's also fighting, not just between cats, but between cats and wildlife as well. And feeding close to busy roads can cause cats to be hit by cars. While the cats and people get something out of offering just food, is it doing more harm to the community cats than good? Can populations be managed this way? I would like to continue to look into the motivation for this behavior and dig deeper into the consequences. I'm Ramya from UFC College of Education and my topic is health hazards of the human nature relationship and here the introduction is due diligence has shown the great ways in which people are connected to the natural world throughout the past century and has attracted attention to the interaction between humans and nature. An example of this include how people like natural things, the sustainability of natural resources and the advantages of spending time in nature for one's health. And the next topic is health human health and the interplay between humans and nature the connections between the relationship between people and nature and human health are discussed in this paper it starts by going over each of their notions and theoretical frameworks these ideas will be combined to find areas of convergence as well as existing studies on the possible health effects related to how closely humans are related to nature and lifestyle decisions. A conceptual model that is still in development is suggested as a result, one that considers both the larger environment and uh, anim animals in the context of how they relate to humans and the human population as a whole. In order to facilitate a fuller understanding of the complicities involved in improving human health, the model blends theoretical concepts and empirical techniques from various study domains discussed in this review. And move on to the next, specifying the human nature relationship and nature, observing all of the relationships at the point where nature and mind kind meet is Outside the preview of this essay, the four research fields evaluationary biology, social economics, evaluationary psychology and environmentalism that have focused the most on exploring this topic area or instead summarized below. I then uh, list the points where these linkages converge in an effort of 
characterize the interaction between humans and nature when will serve as context for this write up next the holistic view on the link with natural systems this has provided a greater understanding of the numerous way people are tied to the natural world by examining the major ideas found in evolutionary biology social economics evolutionary psychology and environmentalism each shouldn't be thought of as a distinct entity rather they should be seen as having something in common such as active research areas where parallels can happen and the sharing of information for instance there is a clear relationship between social economics and the environment in terms of balancing power relations and between social economics and biology in terms of health lifestyle and biophilia similar tensions between the field of social economics and evolutionary psychology can arise in connection to people's support for industrial development and the environment next one is taken as a part of the link between health and nature the junction of the human nature interaction and health um, as uh, determined by this review is covered in this sections summary of extant theoretical and scholarly studies uh, here uh, they given as uh, three subsections first physical health second mental health and third one is social health have been used to study this it seeks to open point gaps and restrictions as well as points of convergence here the mainly focuses on the three uh, sub sections physical health and mental health and social health finally come to the conclusion part uh, conceptual model of human and ecosystem health that incorporates the human centered view point is finally put out it addresses the shortcomings of existing models and is based on an interdisciplinary outlook at the nexus of the relationship between humans and nature and human health this is accomplished by combining theoretical ideas and methodological strategies from the study areas discussed in this review giving the data acquired more depth and here um, this is my reference for this paper um thank you thank you for listening anticipation of animals consuming constitutional rights presented by s rajalakshmi m net scholar vivuti college of education tutukudi here the quotes included in this paper that is a no human being is justifi- justified in regarding any animal whatsoever as a meaningless automation to be bought or tortured or eaten as the case may be for the mere object of satisfying the wants or whims of mankind said by upsana broad 2021 and the introduction is in the creation of the world it portrays that the refrain of animal welfare which is said uh, quality of life experienced by an animal and encompasses the animal is coping with his or her current situation and surroundings and here the animal rights is a moral principles grounded in the belief that non human animal uh, deserve the ability to live at the core of animal rights is autonomy which is another way of saying choice next one is a uh, what is animal rights animal rights which is the philosophical concept that animals should have rights such as freedom to spend their lives free of human involvement the cruel treatment of cattle act 1822 which was the first legislation in the world to prohibit animal cruelty several countries constitutions are now include provisions for environmental and animal rights non UN treaties have also been developed to increase awareness regarding animal rights under their own constitution animal rights under the constitutions are 
uh, article 21 the fundamental right to life is everyone has the life sustaining right and cannot be deprived of life or personal liberty unless authorized by this law article 51a is a magna carta of animal rights in india in the same judgment and incorporated the right to life of animals under this law and the articles 48 is uh, uh, to develop animal husbandry using a contemporary scientific method while conserving improving and preventing cow slaughter which is comes under article 48a and the rules under the act is the first one is a 1965 draught and pack animal rules which is the animals should not be employed to pull cars or loads for more than 9 hours per day and the second one is rules for performing animals in 1973 uh, this is the prohibit uh, the use of animals in presenting or training for public performance animal transport regulations this is this is nothing but uh, the establishes the right standards for the size of transport cages uh, uh, that is a uh, slaughterhouse rules a uh, law in 2001 and animal birth control dog rules is nothing but uh, mentions the dog enthusiasia and the enthusiasts are stray dogs that are incredibly ill or damaged and the conclusion is nothing but as a result we can simply say that uh, 